So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think most of you know me, but I'm Kim Mellon, co-director of the Wilton Historical Society, along with Allison Sanders. Welcome to Booked for Lunch. Before I introduce our speaker, I have a few notes on the program's logistics. Please keep your audio setting on mute throughout the program. We will have a Q&A at the end that I will monitor. I encourage all of you to submit questions via the chat feature at the bottom of your screen at any time and I will field the questions at, at the end. Today's author, Andrew W. Carl, will discuss his 2018 book, Free the Beaches, the story of Ned Cole and the battle for America's most exclusive shoreline, which won the 2019 Connecticut Book Award for nonfiction. This book covers two decades of one man's activism towards opening up Connecticut's 253 miles of coastline to all residents, especially to minorities and the urban poor in Hartford. In reading the book, we learn about the plight of people who lived in Hartford's North End and Ned Cole's campaign to help them. We also see the ways that local and state government intentionally kept people in squalid housing projects while the surrounding areas populated by white peoples thrived. On the shoreline, towns and homeowners went to extraordinary lengths to keep non-residents off their beaches. We chose this book for discussion during Black History Month to complement other programs and resources here at Wilton Historical. Earlier this month, Dr. Julie Hughes presented her research into enslaved people in Wilton in a Zoom program entitled Enslaved Black Residents and Their Descendants, Five Lives from Wilton's Past. Dr. Hughes's deep research revealed a part of Wilton's history that had been buried or ignored for a long time. Another resource is a very relevant video on Wilton, um, on Wilton is the History Is Here video, episode 15, titled Race Relations in Wilton, the Human, State, Human Values at Stake. In this eight minute program, Wilton Historical's associate curator, Nick Foster, talks about housing practices in Wilton that discouraged diversification in the town, especially through redlining in the 1930s and 40s. I encourage all of you to watch both of these programs, which are available on the Wilton Historical Society website under the heading videos 24 seven. Together, these two recordings, along with other available History Is Here videos, give voice to unknown Wiltonians and a fuller history of our town and its residents. Our author today, Andrew W. Carl, is a professor at the University of Virginia. He teaches courses on modern African-American history, race and real estate, and on urban America. Prior to Free the Beaches, he published The Land Was Ours, How Black Beaches Became White Wealth in the Coastal South. He has published numerous articles and is currently working on a new project. We are very pleased to have Dr. Carl here today to talk to us about a book that takes place right here in Connecticut. We hope you will enjoy the program and please remember to enter your questions in chat as we go along and, and uh, we will field them at the end. Please welcoming, welcome, please join me in welcoming Professor Carl, and I'll turn it over to you. Oh, well, thank you so much, uh, Kim. And um, thank you to, um, to Nick Foster as well and the staff at the Wilton Historical Society for inviting me to um, speak about my book. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to um, also the chance to um, ask, answer questions um, at the end. Um, give me one second here. Let me just pull up. I've got some slides to go along with this. Okay. Is that what is on your screen right now? Is it a co image of my book? Yes, Andrew, you're up. you're all set. Okay, cool. All right. So, um, yeah. So, free the beaches um, is really it's as as Kim said it, it's a story that's it's set in two vastly different places: um, the Gold Coast of Connecticut. Uh, and the north end of Hartford, um, one a place of wealth and privilege, the other subject to disinvestment and neglect, isolation and broken promises. Um, and it's a story of you know how um, one person brought these two um, places together, um, all you know very in uncomfortable ways, um, but ways that were very revealing of, of some of the larger inequities and struggles 
unfolding. Um, and it's also really the story of America in the 1970s, um, a time when the struggle for civil rights and black freedom ran headfirst into entrenched structural inequalities in schools and housing markets, and even in places of leisure. Um, and when many white Americans uh, mobilized to protect those advantages, uh, often through ostensibly colorblind forms of land use regulation. It's also the story of Connecticut um, in the 20th century, a state where um, its liberal politics um, coexisted often une uneasily with entrenched racial and economic inequality. Um, and it's the story of an enigmatic and very controversial activist um, named Ned Cole, who was the founder of the um, private domestic Peace Corps group organization he dubbed Revitalization Corps. Um, and whose, whose actions really put, um, put issues on the table that many in the state had wished had remained out of view. Um, and finally, it's a story about beaches um, as physical, legal, and cultural spaces and how they came to shape and reflect broader changes in American life in the 20th century. And, I, and I, I really believe that we can learn a lot about how societies are structured and how they interact by spending time on, its, on, a, on a beach. You know, by seeing who uses it and how, who is kept away from it and why, and seeing how people over time have attempted to change it physically, and how beaches as dynamic um, environments in their own right have resisted humans' attempts to shape and control. Um, and that's kind of what got me interested in studying the history of beaches, um, that, you know, this sort of dynamic interplay between, um, you know, human society um, and the environment and how those, um, how those interactions have oftentimes, you know, been you know, both shaped and reflected larger struggles and inequalities um, unfolding um, at a particular moment and place and time. And just to be clear, you know, sort of technically speaking, to kind of you know sort of give us sort of broader um, sort of you know history here you know technically speaking um, throughout much of human history um, beaches have legally um, and commonly been understood to be public land you know a commons a place that was not subject to sort of private um, enclosure um, this is laid out here in the U.S. with um, in the public trust doctrine which um, you know dates back to you know. Um, British common law that was incorporated into American jurisprudence um, and, and understands and treats um, shorelines as public lands um, that, are that are entrusted to states for use by the public. Um, and for much of human history, that's kind of you know, how um, beaches have been treated um, as public space. Um, and in Connecticut in particular, um, you know, the, the, the technical, the, the, the boundary line between um, where private property ends and where public space begins um, is drawn at the mean high tide line. Um, meaning that, you know, everything, all land below that um, belongs to the public. Um, and, and this was not a sort of controversial issue for much of the state's history, or at least, you know, into um, the early 20th century, because in part, um, these were not areas that were highly coveted um, for um, private development. But that began to change um, quite dramatically um, in the early to mid 20th century. Um, and this, and this, not just in Connecticut, but around the, around the country, you began to see um, real estate developers working to create um, new beachfront um, residential developments and leisure resorts and summer home communities along shorelines, um, often doing so with the blessing and aid of, of coastal engineers who reshaped these shorelines and, and attempted to kind of tame these unruly environments, all in the interest of, of promoting um, growth um, and um, you know, appreciating property values. And, and oftentimes doing so in defiance of, of nature's limits and of the kind of unique features of coastal environments. You know, coastal you know, shorelines kind of exist um, in a state of, of dynamic equilibrium. They don't remain fixed in place. They're constantly sort of changing their shape, and they really resist the you know attempts of, um, of developers and of, of, of people to kind of define and um, you know boundary lines and um, limit um, their uh, mobility. Uh, but nevertheless, we see here, you know, um, into the early 20 and mid 20th century, you know, as um, 
beaches become prize destinations for um, leisure activities and for um, vacationers um, as they become highly sought out um, as, as um, for as leisure and recreational spaces, um, they became increasingly inaccessible to the general public. Um, and this was especially the case in Connecticut, um, where beginning in the early 20th century, um, real estate developers began acquiring vast tracts of coastal property and with uh, charters from the state, uh, founded what came to be known as private beach associations. Um, by the 1950s, um, the state was home to um, 54 of these private beach associations, along with 184 private clubs. Um, and as you know, and 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 as these places proliferated, uh, public access to the state shoreline um, was diminished. Um, you know, where um, as you know, as more people flocked to Connecticut shores, the shore itself became less public in nature, less a commons that could be used freely as it had long been and more of a private space where access was restricted to a privileged few. Um, and so in a sense, you know, we began to see, you know, rather than, um, you know, beaches in the state, rather than bringing, you know, people of different backgrounds you know, together into a common space, instead working to sort people into different groups and um, separate people spatially by race, by ethnicity, by class, by religion. Um, and we see this kind of in the, the, the charters of these private beach associations that were proliferating. You know, these were often founded by and came to be associated with distinct ethnic groups, you know, Irish Catholics, Italians, wasps. Um, they define, you know, they define themselves as much by who they kept out as by who they welcomed. Um, all of these um, new developments placed um, restrictive covenants on property deeds, forbidding the sale of lots to um, people of disfavored racial and, um, you know, and religious groups. And um, just as they often you know, kept um, you know, blacks and Jews from buying lots in their summer enclaves, uh, private beach associations often as well work to keep outsiders from even being able to walk along or enjoy the beach, including the land that was legally um, public. Um, so this, we began to see a kind of an enclosure happening along the state shoreline um, in the mid 20th century um, and a privatization, an effective privatization of public space. Um, this was coupled with um, the, the growth of, of public beaches um, being created by shoreline towns, places like um, uh, Brantford, Connecticut, um, or Greenwich or Westport uh, or Fairfield. Um, you know, but these were increasingly became kind of public beaches in name only, um, you know, that, you know, the people found the, the people you would expect to find on public beaches along the state shoreline often mirrored the people who lived in shoreline towns, um, shoreline towns that are often um, also governed by um, racial covenants, um, you know, in their um, housing markets and other exclusionary practices that um, limited access to people of color. Um, and that was also then coupled with the fact that in, um, in these towns um, that had small minority populations, they um, also included in their public beaches um, ordinances um, that prohibited non-residents from using public, um, public beaches or, or made it incredibly difficult for um, you know, non-residents to be able to access them. Um, you know, towns that didn't um, enact outright bans on non-residents would say charge higher fees for accessing them um, or you know, limit parking for non-residents or other measures aimed at dissuading um, the general public from enjoying public beaches. Um, and this, you know, and, and as I found, and as I kind of describe in the book, um, in the opening chapters, you know, invariably these types of um, restrictions on public access had particular types, groups of people in mind. Um, you know, in the town of Madison, Connecticut, for instance, I found that really the first push to restrict access to the town beach um, came after a group of beachfront homeowners complained about African American servants who worked in white families' homes um, during the summer months um, using the beach during off hours. Um, and that, at that moment, um, you know, the presence of African Americans using the town beach is what spurred the town to then um, take action to limit access to residents only. And 
um, in, you know, tellingly, um, it defined um, servants working in um, white homeowners' households as being non-residents. Um, you know, shoreline, you know, again, shoreline towns as well, even for um, those, you know, the, you know, towns that had small African American populations, they often made it known that they, all, you know, regardless of whether they live there or not, they were not welcomed. Um, as one African American um, resident of, of the town of Brantford um, explained to an interviewer, um, you know, he said, you know, I heard that they did everything possible to discourage Negroes from using the beach. And so I see no sense in looking for trouble. So, you know, the, you know, here in New England in the 1950s and 60s, you know, at a time where much of the public's attention on the problem of segregation in America was directed at the South, and you know, much of the sort of battles over, you know, the, the high-profile battles, um, struggles for civil rights were were taking place in, in states like Mississippi and Alabama, where you know there was, you know, where signs of Jim Crow um, and segregation was, you know, encoded in every aspect of public life. You know, I'm, you know, as my book shows, you know, in Connecticut, another form of Jim Crow is, uh, um, is, is in operation and, and its effects on the mobility and access for um, African-Americans living in the state could often seem eerily similar to that that African-Americans living in the South experienced at that same time. Um, and so what this meant was, is that, you know, um, in total, you know, combining these private beach associations um, that privatized their shorelines, and then along with uh, public beaches that really um, were um, restricted to residents only, what that meant was, is that if you weren't fortunate enough to live in a shoreline, com shoreline community or own a cottage in a private beach association, um, your, your options were very limited in, in where you could go to enjoy the state shoreline. Um, you know, they were essentially limited to one of the three state beaches, um, which by the early 1970s um, often routinely filled beyond capacity before noon on a summer weekend. Um, so making it very difficult, again, for um, many families to be able to, you know, spend a day at the beach. Um, or say if you lived in one of the um, state's older um, industrial cities, um, like New Haven, um, or Bridgeport um, that did have large um, African-American populations, but also whose shorelines at this time were suffering from heavy um, amounts of pollution um, and whose public um, you know, beaches were themselves suffering from um, the neglect resulting from the city's own um, you know, um, financial struggles. And so you know, by the time we get to the early 1970s, when the story really begins, you know, um, you know, public health officials in, in towns like um, Bridgeport and New Haven and New London um, have, have you know, closed off public beaches as being not safe for bathing. Um, so there too, um, you know, even those who are living in, um, in shoreline cities are finding that access to um, you know, public um, you know, outdoor recreation is also very limited. Um, and it's important to point, you know, that for, 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 for most middle and upper middle class whites living in Connecticut during these years, um, those who spent their summers on the shore, most of them were blissfully unaware of these inequities. Um, and that was the point, you know, beaches, um, you know, that you know, part of kind of the way that segregation worked, in, um, and especially in the Northeast, was to kind of... Um, make many of these sort of um, you know, barriers um, almost invisible. And certainly uh, the, privilege, the, um, the enhanced privileges that white, um, whites living in the state enjoyed is something almost kind of you know, woven into the, um, the environment in ways that were almost in, imperceptible to its beneficiaries. Um, and, and this was the world in which um, the, the central character in this story, Ned Cole, grew up in. Um, you know, Ned Cole was... Um, he was born in Hartford in 1941 um, into a middle class um, Irish Catholic family. Um, he was the only son of his parents um, who, you know, had you know, placed great hopes um, that their son would, you know, go um, and you know, you know, rise through the ranks to a nice, um, comfortable middle class life um, that seemed to be the destiny of, of you know, um, you know, middle class Irish Catholic families in, in living in cities like Hartford. Uh, he went to Fairfield College um, and seemed destined for you know, a white collar job in, say, Hartford's insurance um, industry, um, which is what his parents hoped for him. Um, you know, he was destined in many ways to someday own a summer cottage on the shore, um, like many who he grew up with and went to college with. 
Um, that was until um, he began to start getting radical ideas put in his head by a college professor at Fairfield College, um, a man by the name of Walter Petrie, um, who um, um, was, was um, the only um, person of color on the faculty at Fairfield at the time and was teaching courses in, in history um, that, you know, they included uh, exposing um, the you know, mostly white um, student body to the realities of urban life um, in ways that Ned Cole had never really seen um, you know, firsthand before. He, um, you know, Professor Peacher would, would take groups of students from Hartford, uh, from, from, excuse me, from Fairfield down to um, Harlem, and they would um, go and he would, you know, talk about the history, the culture, the life, and also the struggles um, of, of people living in, um, you know, urban ghettos in the in 1960s America. Um, and, and Ned was really, you know, as a young, as a, you know, you know, young, very devoutly Catholic person who, you know, really took the kind of social justice uh, mission of, of the church seriously, was deeply alarmed by what he saw. You know, he was alarmed by the rats, the slumlords, the price gouging merchants, and the daily struggle of, of people to survive. Um, but he was even more alarmed by White's indifference to all this, um, you know, that was, you know, the cushy life of, of middle class comfort um, that's, that was his kind of birthright was something that he was very uncomfortable with. Um, and he saw that as part of the problem that was fueling the persistence of these um, inequalities, the fact that, you know, so many, um, you know, so many of his classmates, so many of the families who grew up around were, um, you know, sort of almost, you know, kind of indifferent to the struggles of people living on the other side of the cities um, that they lived, they, they were a part of, um, and that many of them were escaping from in, into, um, you, know, on, you know, suburban enclaves. And that, in those experiences and what, he, you know, what was exposed to him really stuck with him after he graduated from Fairfield. Um, and took a job um, working um, as an advertising um, in advertising for an insurance company in Hartford, um, and you know, it was really for him. It was after um, John F. Kennedy's assassination um, in 1963 um, that was kind of one of these moments where um, you know Ned Cole kind of asked himself, you know, what what is he doing with his life? And he really sort of um, took stock of where he was and what he wanted to do. Um, and what kind of difference he wanted to make in the world. And it was at that moment where he, um, you know, he um, quit his job, took all of his, his life savings and um, rented a storefront in Hartford's Black Ghetto and founded this group called Revitalization Corps um, and began launching a series of programs um, that really, you know, all, that ran the gamut from, you know, providing job training and tutoring to, pestering city officials and slumlords um, to, you know, sort of respond to the needs of, of their constituents um, or their tenants. Um, but, but a lot of the work is, you know, it's very much aimed at trying to facilitate, um, you know, contact, communication, and meaningful sort of relationships between, um, you know, whites who had, you know, many of whom had moved out to places like West Hartford um, and, um, and those who are living in places like Hartford's North End. Um, by, you know, setting up tutoring programs that would bring, um, you know, young idealistic, um, you know, white families into the city, um, and also as well facilitate um, opportunities for um, um, black and brown children living in Hartford to have access to um, the resources um, and amenities that um, middle class whites living in suburbs enjoyed. And really a big issue and you know and and, and for Ned you know again com coming from a um, his own background you know he had a lot to learn you know a lot to learn about the realities of life um, in Hartford and 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 he spent a lot of time really listening and especially working with the mothers who um, who lived in um, in the neighborhoods where revitalization Corps was doing its work and he kind of developed this sort of um, Sort of almost a kind of you know team of, of 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 black women who really kind of you know kind of shaped his thinking on what um, the problems were, what the needs were, what kind of you know work um, could be done um, to address the sort of um, the situations that were um, that they were facing, and really and. Early on, um, you know, one of the big issues that kept coming up, you know, an area where there was a real need um, was providing opportunities for outdoor recreation, especially for children during the summer months when, when kids were out of school. Um, 
And, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is, you know, you know, kind of telling, you know, the story of, of Hartford and telling the story of segregation in the city was, you know, how, you know, by this point in time in the 1960s, you know, cities had really, you know, disinvested in public recreation programs, you know, um, parks, swimming pools had seen their funding cut, many of them had closed, um, as whites had moved out of cities and cities had seen their tax bases erode. Um, you know, most cities had never built parks or swimming pools in black neighborhoods in the first place. Um, as a result, you would have, you know, um, you know, children living on the north end, you know, looking for you know something to do on a summer afternoon or a, a place to cool off would oftentimes swim in dangerous polluted rivers and streams um, where um, drowning deaths happened with shocking regularity during summer months and this was a, a phenomenon that was happening in cities across the country and especially in the northeast um, you know one you know just to give one um, story here, you know, in the summer of 1968, um, two African American children who lived in um, Port Chester, New York, which is just across the border from Connecticut, um, drowned while swimming in the Byram River. Um, and, you know, as these boys were drowning, you know, literally less than a mile away, lifeguards were keeping a watchful eye over children playing on a public beach in Greenwich. But again, despite its close proximity, um, these beaches, um, these supervised um, recreational spaces were not an option for these two black children from Port Chester because those beaches were for residents only. Um, so, you know, again, you can see here the sort of, you know, these deprivations had you know, life and death consequences. Um, and this was, a, and it also really fueled a lot of the, um, the organizing um, amongst Black mothers in cities like Hartford. Um, you know, one of the stories I tell in the book is, is of um, the um, you know, action against uh, or to, to force the city of Hartford to take action on, um, on areas along the Park River that um, were um, claiming the lives of, of, you know, of no, no, a number of African-American children um, in the 1960s. Um, um, this, there was a section uh, um, along the Park River where seven children drowned um, near a public housing project over the span of 10 years in the 1960s. Um, and for years, um, city officials ignored the pleas of grieving parents to do something to address this crisis, um, to put fences along the river, to, you know, to lower the river's level. Um, and, and city officials invariably just kind of um, you know, shrugged their shoulders um, and did very little. Um, and, 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 you know, in, in the suburbs of West Hartford, these tragedies barely registered at all. Um, but I think it's important as well to, and this is again, linking this to what was happening nationwide. I mean, these types of senseless tragedies were really fueling the, 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 the unrest um, that was um, bubbling up in, um, in urban America during the, these years and, and played no small role in sparking many of the um, uprisings that um, happened in, um, in cities during these long hot summers of the 1960s. Um, in fact, um, in its 1968 report on the causes of civil disorder in American cities, the Kerner Commission noted that um, the absence of safe, healthy um, places of play ranked high amongst the list of grievances expressed by African Americans. Americans in riot torn cities. Um, they were, you know, you know, recreational inequality was just below police brutality, unemployment and poor schools on the list of the most intense grievances expressed um, by um, urban black populations. Um, and in some cities that, you know, these types of tragedies actually provided the spark that lit, um, you know, you know, broad, um, you know, um, you know, conflicts. And, you know, for, and, and, and this was also the case in Hartford, um, where, you know, there were, um, you know, protests um, and what, you know, mothers, um, you, know, you know, stopping traffic, um, you know, um, over a bridge that crossed the Park River um, in the summer, in the spring of 1969. I mean, this was something that was really um, playing out in a direct way and, and having a real direct impact on, on how Ned Cole in particular was thinking about these problems, you know, and he, um, in particular, you know, his, you know, he, you know, his view was, you know, he spent, he, he, he really resisted um, the types of, you know, um, you know, you know, talking, he, he's less interested in kind of sitting around and talking and debating issues and more interested in doing immediate action. And so for him, you know, he sees children drowning in a river in Hartford, he sees parents coming to him saying, you know, we need to find ways to get our kids out and, you know, find, you know, healthy and safe recreational activities for them during the summer months. 
Um, and his, you know, his response is, okay, let's do this now. And so he literally just, you know, um, in, um, in the summer of 1970, um, rents a bunch of school buses and decides we're going to start, you know, taking trips down to the state shoreline. We'll go spend a day at the beach, um, get kids out of the neighborhood, expose them to a new environment. Um, this will, you know, again, the type of sort of, this is very much in line with the type of work that Revitalization Corps was doing. Um, these type of direct actions that were really aimed at addressing immediate needs. Um, so, you know, with the um, support of the kind of group of mothers who he was working with, you know, they went and, you know, what drove through the north end scoop kids up you know put them on a bus and started heading to the shore um for what they hoped would be just a, you know a day at the beach um a day and an opportunity as well for many of these children to interact with um kids from different backgrounds to kind of see a world that you know and to see a, you know, a place like the beach that few of them had ever seen in their lives um it did not begin as a protest um, in, in any sense. In fact, you know, as, as Ned you know, later just told me, I mean, he, he had no idea that the beach was off limits in, in such a way. This was um, not something that he was even aware of, um, but he found out and they found out when they got there. Um, you know, they were not greeted warmly when um, they rolled into some of these towns, um, you know, with a busload of black and brown kids from Hartford um, seeking to access the town beach or, um, you know, invariably, you know, police would be summoned, um, they would, you know, you know, tell them, you know, they would point to the sign saying for, you know, resident only or private beach, um, ugly racist incidents um, happened, you know, adults spewing racist invective at core volunteers, parents grabbing their children and pulling them away from, you know, the, yeah, the African American kid who their, you know, their children was playing with, um, you know, it was a very, a lot of really ugly incidents unfolded. And for, and for Ned, in particular, this sort of opened him, his eyes up to a whole new set of problems that he was, you know, previously unaware of, um, and 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 really sort of galvanized him to want to take action against this particular issue of of beach privatization. You know, he believed that there was, um, and he saw firsthand that there was you know, racist motives behind these ostensibly, you know, colorblind. Um, you know, measures that, you know, limited access to residents only or to uh, members of a beach association. Um, he was, you know, he, he, he believed that, you know, this was something that um, needed to be brought to the public's attention and that there needed to be action taken um, to address and make the beach a more public space, make it a place where um, children from the North End, you know, could enjoy and feel welcome at. And, and this as well is something, you know, that I, in the book, I also situate the story of what was, what um, began in Connecticut um, in the 1970s within, a, within a broader national context, um, because, you know, this was not happening in a vacuum. In fact, you know, there was growing sentiment um, across the country in the late 1960s um, that beaches had become um, overdeveloped and inaccessible. Um, there was a growing chorus of critics and activists who were um, fighting to um, restore the public nature of America's shorelines after decades of, of development and privatization. Um, and this again was something that was very much a sort of you know story of post-war America. You know that you know you know. As we began to see, you know, you know, growing prosperity, growing, um, you know, many Americans were flocking to shorelines for for vacation, for leisure, um, and finding that you know access was um, severely restricted. Um, and so this, you know, sparked the this sort of both a social and legal movement um, against um, beach privatization. Um, known as kind of, you know, kind of under this umbrella term of the open beaches movement. Um, this resulted in um, numerous lawsuits that were being filed. And really, it was in the late 1960s and throughout the 1970s, where we, we see many of these um, lawsuits being filed, um, trying to force, um, you know, you know, you know public access um, or, or restore public access to um, sections of shorelines. Um, and also as well, um, a push for legislation, both at the federal and state level, um, to um, affirm the public status of shorelines and to place restrictions on, on what private homeowners and, and um, localities could do to limit public, public access. And there were notable achievements um, in this uh, movement. Um, state agencies were established um, in, in several states to uh, monitor and protect public access rights and limit private development. 
Uh, most notably, um, the states of, of Texas, California, and Oregon um, put in place really robust um, and expansive um, public access uh, provisions um, and, and state agencies. Um, this movement really also succeeded in getting this principle of public beach access uh, written into uh, the uh, Monumental Coastal Zone Management Act of 1972, which was the most significant um, federal legislation on, on coastal environments to date. Um, so this, again, was a, a time where a lot of, um, you know, there was a lot of attention increased attention and, and um, scrutiny of, of beach access restrictions and efforts to really um, you know, expand this um, and declare that, you know, these are areas that were, um, you know, legally belong to everyone. Um, but the, the fight that unfolded in Connecticut was, was much more direct. And that's because Ned Cole was not interested in, in filing lawsuits. He was not interested um, in, um, you know, phoning his, you know, phoning lawmakers and lobbying for changes. He, he, he took his fight directly to the beach. Um, and, you know, really following some of these real ugly incidents um, that um, he and um, Revitalization Corps members encountered, um, he, what began again as a sort of um, summer program to get kids on the beach um, quickly turned into a decades long series of protests um, and direct actions aimed at, um, you know, both calling public attention to the problem of, of beach privatization and seeking to shame these communities um, over their um, exclusionary practices um, and doing so in a kind of um, through often headline grabbing in your face tactics. Um, you know, like the time when he staged this um, amphibious invasion of a private um, country club in Madison, um, you know, where they, you know, again, kind of highlighting here the fact that, you know, the, 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 the you know, up to the high water mark um, was public land and they had every right to enjoy it. Um, but, you know, as he was pointing out here as well, um, that, that public right didn't mean much when the only way you could get to the shore was by, by water, um, you know, that all access points from land had been effectively closed off by private homeowners. Um, he also, um, on another occasion, um, hired a parachutist to um, jump out of an airplane carrying a banner that read Free America's Beaches on the 4th of July. Um, and, and one summer, he, um, circumve he circumvented um, the town of Madison's restrictions on beach access by renting out an entire motel for the summer um, and bringing busloads of children down every week um, and, you know, exploiting the fact that the town did permit, um, you know, those who were staying in hotels to be able to um, utilize the town beach. Um, so this was, again, you know, and, and, and you know, these were... Think, you know, issues that really, you know, captured a lot of public attention. Um, but, but, I, but I also balance in telling the story of this, I also balance this out by, by, by noting that, you know, most of what they were doing was bringing, you know, giving kids um, from underprivileged neighborhoods a chance to enjoy a day at the beach. Um, and, and for, for many of them, and I, I, I conducted interviews with many um, you know, folks who, um, who, who were kids at the time who went on these trips, you know, many of them didn't know that they were even taking part in a protest um, just by being there. Um, they, they, they were there to have a good time. Um, they saw it as an adventure. Um, they, you know, they kind of, they, they sensed that something was happening in the background as, you know, sort of, um, you know, adults were um, arguing with each other. But for them, this was, you know, this was fun. Um, and in a sense, and, and that I think says a lot about kind of, um, you know, the issue, the underlying issues as well is, you know, for, for black children, um, you know, just, you know, enjoying a day at the beach was in a sense of kind of a protest against um, these kind of um, larger inequities. Um, and this is kind of, you know, again, these, these stories here about, you know, the, um, like this amphibious landing at Madison's, um, you know, country club. Um, this was really where I first learned about Ned Cole. Um, you know, the, there's ample news coverage of this, um, you know, for a time, um, the the battle for um, Connecticut's shoreline, you know, became national news. Uh, many of his, you know, high profile protests were being covered in the New York Times and many, um, you know, increasingly in national publications. And so, you know, this was where I first sort of encountered this story. Um, and um, then after, you know, after kind of learning a bit about it, I, you know, I then got to know Ned Cole personally, um, you know, interviewed him for, for many hours um, to kind of get a sense of his um, story. 
um, and his perspective on what was happening. And also as well, meeting uh, many of the people who were involved in this movement, uh, the mothers, um, the, um, the children, um, and as well, um, those who um, lived in these shoreline towns and how they responded um, to you know, the protests that were happening and also um, how they reacted to um, you know, what Ned Cole was trying to do. Um, and, you know, and I think, you know, one thing that I sort of describe in the book, I mean, you know, politically, this became a real, you know, um, divisive issue, um, especially in the, you know, during the 1970s, um, you know, Ned Cole became as, 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 you know, one person put it, you know, a four letter, a four letter word um, in many shoreline towns um, during the 1970s. Um, and, you know, as, as you can see here from this, this was um, a, a campaign ad for, um, you know, 1973 race in Greenwich, you know, this, this sort of beach issue became one of these, you know, real, you know, flashpoint, you know, you know, issues um, locally, you know, you know, local, um, you know, people running for office tried to sort of, you know, one up each other on how, um, how, you know, sort of um, how tough you could be on this issue, how, you know, how restrictive um, your you were in trying to limit access. Um, and, but I also, you know, found that um, th this was by no means the sort of um, unanimous view uh, amongst many shoreline residents. And in fact, there was quietly many who, um, who supported what Ned Cole was trying to do and supported the principle of expanding public access um, to the state shoreline. Um, but, but make no mistake, this was a very divisive issue. And, I, and, and, and the children, um, who were a part of this, you know, many of them did encounter, um, it's, you know, um, instances of racism, many of the volunteers, um, you know, you know, you know, as net as revitalization core grew it, you know, sort of attracted a large number of, um, you know, idealistic, you know, college age students, you know, um, some of whom were attacked in, um, in these towns, um, there was an instance of art an arson attack on one of the, um, places where Re revitalization core members were staying, um, Two of the young female um, volunteers were assaulted in, in Madison. Um, so this was very much a kind of, um, you know, an issue that um, really brought out some of the worst in people um, in many of these communities, even as it brought out, you know, sort of exposed um, and, and compelled others to really um, stand up in support of, of the principle of what, um, you know, Revitalization Corps was trying to do. Um, and so I think, you know, I'll you know, that's, I think, you know, one of the sort of um, particular legacies of this, but also as well, I think, you know, the, um, the history that, I, that the book tries to tell really also tries to point um, to, you know, some of the damage that um, these um, exclusionary practices not only inflicted on um, the people of Connecticut as a whole, but also on the environment of the coast itself. Um, that many of these sort of measures, as you see here, you know, um, you know the fences, the jetties, um, the other sorts of, um, and as well, you know, homes that are being built right up to um, the water's edge, um, were really, um, you know, damaging to the very thing that you know, folks were trying to keep to themselves, namely the beach. Um, you know, by the late 1970s, um, you know, one state agency described the Connecticut coast as overdeveloped as lacking in public space um, and, and you know, calling attention to the fact that many of its tidal wetlands have been filled or degraded. Um, and you know, many, much of the kind of overdevelopment um, and, you know, and the um, efforts to sort of um, restrict access um, through physical barriers you know, left um, a damaging environmental legacy, um, which in my mind, and I'll just sort of, you know, and there I think is, and kind of we can turn to questions is, you know, it, it points to the fact that, you know, you know, in this book, ultimately, I guess you could say it's really a story of the damage that uh, extreme inequality inflicts on society and on the environment itself, and how those two are related, um, and how that the struggle for racial justice and environmental su sustainability are also inseparable. Um, and this is, you know, again, especially important right now um, at a time where um, we are seeing, you know, the struggle for racial justice um, continue, but we're also, you know, doing so on a warming planet um, with rising sea levels. And also this book really, I, I'd hope to, this book, you know, aims to provoke kind of like Ned Cole did um, questions about what kind of society we want to live in. Um, do we want to live in one that's open and inclusive or one that's exclusive and exclusionary? We want to live in one where public spaces are abundant and a democratic culture thrives, 
Or do we want to live in one where the privileged hoard resources to themselves and build walls around themselves um, to keep the public out? And I think, you know, in this respect, I see beaches um, really, you know, here in Connecticut and elsewhere, really, um, you know, holding a mirror to the societies that they surround. Uh, and that's really the story that um, this book aims to tell and hopefully kind of provokes a healthy conversation about um, where we go from here. So I, um, again, thank you for um, joining me um, and you know, listening to me talk a little bit about the book. And I'm really looking forward to um, questions, comments, um, and other reactions to it. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. Uh, we do have, we have mostly comments um, in the chat. So one, one of our participants is, um, name is Liz, whose mother is Jane Locks. And she was 11 years old when Ned Cole first arrived at Old Lime Shores. It was a very traumatic experience to see the anger and violence unleashed on the children and those who sought to host them. Were you able to interview people from that community? Um, from Old Lime Shores, I um, I don't believe I interviewed anyone from that particular, but I am very familiar with um, what sh um, is being described. And I yes, I um, and that particular incident was one that was um, covered extensively um, in the in the local media as well. Um, no, I um, but yeah, that's um, thank you for sharing that. And I think again, that's um, you know kind of. Um, helps extend what, um, what I'd sort of found um, in my own research. Um, are you looking at the chat? Yeah, I see it. Um, there are a lot of comments that I, I don't wanna really read them all, but maybe you wanna pick out some things that you wanna talk about. Yeah, so um, just going down the list here, I can see, you know, um, you know one thing I, I didn't mention, um, but I think it's worth noting here and is that, you know this, um, and I bring I, I bring the story uh, uh, up in the book. I bring the story up to the present, or you know at least up to the um, 2010 teens. And and it's important to note, you know that you know these um, you know while there has been progress, and and there are groups um, right now who are um, fighting to um, extend and um, protect public access to the state shoreline. Um, this is by no means a sort of, you know, something that has been, you know, um, a part of our past. It, this is an ongoing issue. Um, it's something that, as as, um, as one of the folks pointed out here, I mean, you know, the the um, many town beaches, while um, they can no longer um, bar non-residents, they still and very much do um, find ways to make it as as difficult as possible for non-residents to access town beaches. So like in, um, in Westport here in particular, um, you know, there has been, um, you know, it's been noted that, you know, the town has, you know, really, you know, raised quite dramatically, um, you know, fees for non-residents. And this is something that, again, you know, so one of the, many of your, uh, many of the folks in the audience are probably might be familiar with the, the decision that um, was handed down by the um, state Supreme Court in 2001. Um, and this is the case of, um, uh, Layden versus uh, Greenwich, in which um, they ruled that Greenwich, um, in this case, but any you know shoreline town, could not um, have a resident-only um, public beach, um, which is what Greenwich had at the time. But it left open the left the door open for um, restrictions, like say you know again charging differential fees for residents, non-residents, limiting parking, other sorts of measures, which um, in practice could make um, you know, very difficult um, for non-residents to um, access. And that's really what we've seen over the last several decades is, um, you know, um, exclusive towns, you know, really, you know, you know using whatever legal tools are, st are still available to, um, you know, restrict access. Um, I spoke out about this a little in, a, in an op-ed um, in the summer of 2020, um, when we saw, um, you know, as a result of, um, you know, concern, you know, as the pandemic was first, uh, you know, getting underway, and um, there were, um, you know, there was many towns were using the um, the pandemic um, as a as a as a kind of a as a vehicle for um, 
dusting off and reintroducing resident only restrictions. Um, and this, you know, was something that was very, um, very much in the news that summer, because, you know, again, there were, um, it was being done under um, the banner of, you know, public health concerns. Um, but there were, you know, real grave implications, um, and, you know, questions as to the sincerity of those concerns, as opposed, you know, as opposed to say, um, using the, the pandemic as a pretext for, um, you know, reintroducing um, exclusionary measures. Um, and it's something, again, that will be um, sort of, you know, it's being monitored and there are, you know, many folks in Connecticut who are very active in, you know, in, in doing the work of trying to protect public access and guard against these types the reintroduction of these types of restrictions, whether it be from towns or whether it be from individual homeowners. Um, so... Yeah. I have a question for you. In, in the book, and you didn't really touch on that in this discussion, it seems more clear as Ned goes along in his life that he, I don't know if you want to say loses a grip on reality, but his tactics become more and more outrageous and, you know, almost like a performance. So when you were doing your research for the book, did you see any, um, I assume you knew him as an older man, obviously, you didn't know him when mm -hmm. he was young. Did you find many dis discrepancies between his report on what happened and what was actually reported in your research? Did he have a good, clear grip on what he was doing? Yeah, After so fact, this I mean, is a tricky one to answer um, in the sense, and I want to, you know, again, be very respectful of, um, you know, the sincerity of Ned's beliefs. I mean, he, uh, as I kind of talk about um, toward the end of the book, I mean, Ned um, really took a, a, a turn um, in the early 1990s um, toward, um, you know, very um, you know, deeply held um, and strongly, strongly held um, religious beliefs. Um, he really, um, you know, really focused almost the entirety of his energy and really kind of shifted the focus of revitalization course, such as it was at that time, um, into um, his, um, you know, very strong views um, as a, you know, devout Catholic. And kind of, um, in many ways, that became sort of um, his life work subsequent to that, um, after he had this, um, you know, what he described as a sort of revelation. Um, and so for me, the challenge as a, as a historian who was seeking to engage with him and get him to sort of tell his life story was less so um, the accuracy of of a, his description of events and more so how he was framing them through a particular lens, um, through um, what he was, what he believed and what um, he was passionate about at that time. So it presented as, as someone who is, you know, as a historian who does a lot of oral histories, um, who's interviewed, you know, numerous people for, for many different projects, uh, Ned presented a, a different type of challenge for me um, in that I was constantly having to kind of steer the conversation back to the past and he really wanted to talk about things that were on his mind right now um, and things that you know he was concerned about were happening in America today um, and so it was I kind of you know probably have you know you know of the you know of the you know I can't I don't even know how many hours I you know at least 20 hours of, of audio recordings with him but I mean so many of it was kind of this pro, you know this process of steering the conversation back and eventually in fact actually a lot of the most productive interviews I had with Ned um, came at a certain point where I you know I, I was kind of you know I'd come home after you know spending a day talking with him and I would just be like all right well how do we I, I need to try a new approach here because it doesn't seem like we're kind of we're not staying on on track or at least in the conversations kind of go off the rails and so I decided you know I you know he's retired now he had um, he has some time he has some time on his hands and I said do you have do you have time to go down to the beach so we you know he hopped in my car and we drove down to the shore and we went you know, from town to town and went and sort of, you know, went to many of the places that were some of where these events took place. And that kind of focused the conversation and kind of got it really, um, you know, we spent, you know, those were the, some of the most productive interviews. Although <laughs> when we were on the beach, it was a really windy day. So the audio quality was horrible, <laughs> but nevertheless, you know, these are really great conversations. Um, you know, and it was, you know, since it was a windy day, no one seemed to mind that we were walking on all these private beaches where we weren't allowed. <laughs> and, and, and Ned got a great kick out of that, you know, sort of invading these spaces at another time, um, even though no one was there to really pay us any mind. Um, but yeah, so I think, you know, uh, 
you know, there's a whole sort of set of practices that, you know, you follow when you're verifying, you know, and trying to compare what it is you're learning, you know, what it is someone's telling you in an oral history interview versus what the, you know, written record shows. Um, and I tried to sort of at least do as, you know, kind of as best as I could in kind of, you know, finding, you know, you know the most accurate um, story. But I think, you know, again, in answer to your question, I mean, you know, um, it was very much, um, you know, he, I don't think in many ways, you know, yeah, he, uh, he, by the time I met him, he had, you know, Re Revitalization Corps really only existed in name only. Um, it was not active. Um, and many of the people who he'd worked with were no longer, you know, associated with him. But, you know, the thing that really stood out to me, you know, early on was how, you know, many of the, the children, the kids who, who grew up in the North End, you know, who still live there. I mean, you know, many of them, you know, they stuck with Ned, even as many of the, you know, the white college grads and other associates abandoned him, you know, treated him as a religious fanatic and, you know, didn't want to associate with him. You know, the folks who have stuck with him were the folks who he, you know, the, the, the families and, and, the, and the folks on the North End who he, you know, was, you know, working closely with, you know, folks um, like G. Lester, who, you know, owns a barber shop on, on North Main Street, um, you know, he and his brothers who, you know, I tell their story throughout the book. I mean, you know, they, you know, they grew up at, at Revitalization Corps, you know, you know, they go there after school, they go on trips, they, you know, there was just a lot of, there's a lot of activity going on there at a time, again, where, you know, that neighborhood was suffering from massive disinvestment and neglect um, at all levels. Um, and so, you know, there were, and those are still the folks who, you know, who still care for Ned and, you know, still sort of, um, you know, you know, keep in touch with him. And so that, you know, early on that sort of, you know, seeing that and kind of spending time, you know, hanging out at, you know, G's Barbershop on the North End, you know, spending time in the sort of places um, where Revitalization Corps was once active, um, really kind of showed me a lot about that. Yeah, he was someone who was, you know, he, he created headlines, he created spectacles, but his his legacy in a lot of ways was really um, felt in the in the children and the families who's um, who who he worked with and and they and they remember a different side of Ned not the one you know that was on the you know attracting headlines but really a, the kind of the day to day work he was doing to sort of help families who were struggling at a time where everyone else had seemed to have turned their backs on them. Yeah. So we did get a couple other comments, questions that came in. Um, someone is asking if anything has really changed. And I think we, well, you did actually address that in that the, the high, it still exists, mm -hmm. the uh, keeping the non-residents out by, by pricing and making it difficult to buy the passes and whatnot. Um, and then, oh, someone commented on the local priest who, um, was th that his reaction to Ned was so eye-opening and how did Ned stay devoted to the church after that? Yeah, I mean, this, again, I mean, uh, like I said at the outset, I think, you know, you can learn a lot about, you know, a society by just spending spending an afternoon on its beaches. Uh, I think, you know, you can learn a lot about, you know, a community and its values and what it upholds um, just by, you know, who you find there, you know, and, and a lot about the kind of broader, you um, structural inequalities that shape and, and, uh, and constrain where people can live and where people play. And I think, you know, that was something for, for Ned, you know, and for the, for the, um, for those who are involved in these protests, you know, these were eye-opening moments for everyone where, you know, sort of, um, you know, there was a lot that people revealed about themselves, um, both good and bad, I think. Um, but, you know, certainly, you know, um, and I think, you know, that was something, you know, I think we, for, you know, there was, you know, the Catholic Church and Ned's Catholicism was really important, and um, and perhaps something that I um, didn't stress enough throughout the, the, at least in the chapters on the 1970s, because this was a time really where there's a lot of you know, you know radical Catholic sort of um, priest. I mean, you know who who actually many of whom you know um, were you know, being charismatic, the Catholic charismatic um, movement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this yeah, was and this was. And revitalization corps work was very much in line with a lot of this many of those um you know more prominent priests anti-war activists um and the like you know they were coming in you know you know 
you know, spending time at Revitalization Corps headquarters, um, you know, giving, you know, talks, um, you know, when, when Ned Cole had, you know, rented out the hotel in Madison for the summer, you know, there was, you know, there would be, you know, many folks were kind of pouring in and many of whom were coming from, you know, Catholic universities, uh, were coming from the Catholic anti-war movement. Um, so this was, again, a time where, um, you know, there was a sort of battle taking place within the church um, that, um, in which, and, you know, Ned was very much a part of, um, and putting forward a, you know, a real robust social justice, um, you know, bent to his work and his um, faith. And that was something I think that, you know, he saw was full, you know, that his, um, these attempts to um, open access to the state shoreline were fully in line with um, his, his Catholic faith. Um, let's see, there's a comment about how diverse the beaches on uh, Martha's Vineyard are in the summer. Yeah, I mean, well, so Nor Martha's Vineyard, as you know, many you know, many folks might know, I mean, the, Martha's Vineyard has been and remains, um, you know, a um, one of the you know, a, a summer destination for generations of African Americans. Um, you know, the you know, Oak Bluffs has been um, a place where um, African American families have been gathering. Um, you know, really from the, you know, the early 1900s. Um, and it's something that, um, you know, is a place that um, has, is, has only, has actually only grown in popularity amongst um, African Americans, you know, in, in, in recent decades, you know, the Obamas were going there. So um, it, and it's, um, and it's a very diverse, it's, you know, one of the most diverse sort of summer destinations you will find in the, in the U.S., um, at the same time, you know, Martha's Vineyard is, a, is a, you know, inaccessible in a lot of other ways in that, you know, it is not a, you know, you, um, it is, it is not cheap to spend a week there or even a day on Martha's Vineyard. Um, so, um, you know, while it has a great degree of racial diversity, um, when it comes to say, you know, um, economic diversity, much, much less so, and, and it's become um, pretty, you know, very unaffordable, especially as well for the people who live there year round. So there is a kind of, um, you know, there's, I think, you know, even, even where we see, um, you know, sort of racial diversity, um, there is, I, um, you know, nationwide, um, you know, beach access remains, um, you know, very, you know, restrictive, um, restricted, um, and inaccessible in many, many ways for, um, you know, working families and for, um, for, for those who don't have the sort of um, time or resources to be able to go on, um, you know, you know, extended vacation. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, there's still work to be done, that's for sure. But would you say that in general, Connecticut has made any strides? Um, Absolutely. And I think, again, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, you know, the last couple of summers, I've been really um, heartened to see um, there's been um, a new, new group, the Connecticut Coastal Defense uh, Association, that has, um, you know, really worked to, um, you know, to you know, fight for public access um, and to guard against um, illegal restrictions, um, whether it be done by towns or private homeowners um, as, as well. And this is something that I think, you know, I didn't talk as much about the environmental history that this book aims to tell, but, you know, this is um, an area, you know, beach access, you know, when you talk to folks who are concerned about coastal environments, um, you know, it's, it's well understood that, um, you know, the more accessible beaches are, um, the better, um, the, the better managed they are in terms of protection of their natural resources. And so, you know, in Connecticut, the state's Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, um, you know, the, I've, you know, you know, they were a key resource for me. Um, I, you know, spoke with many of the folks who work in that state agency, um, who work on coastal access issues. Um, you know, there are uh, folks there like Dave Kozak, who, um, who's been instrumental um, within that state agency in working to um, identify access points along the state shoreline. In fact, there's a great map that, um, you know, has been produced by um, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection that, you know, any, any citizen can get that has, you know, detail, you know, right down to the, you know, you know every, um, every um, easement point of access um, along the state shoreline. Many of which, you know, again, um, the public was not aware of, and neighboring homeowners oftentimes tried to make folks unaware of by um, putting obstructions in place. So, at the same time as you know, um, you see um, agents, state agencies, and, and, or, and private organizations working to, um, you know, you know, sort of expand public access. 
um, or at least let the public know, um, you know, where they can, uh, you know, where they can rightfully access the state shoreline today, you know, that's often in tension with um, those who are, um, you know, seeking to limit that. So um, I, I think, again, it is, it, it remains a struggle, um, as with every, as with everything today. I mean, you know, there are, um, there is, you know, movement forward, um, then there's pushback, and that's, you know, that's, you know, that's the his, that's the story of, of many um, you know of these kind of struggles for equality um, that they that they never really are finished they just continue to sort of um, you know, remain um, something that you know we have to be, remain vigilant on. Yeah, well, this has been just a wonderful hour of listening to you talk about your book, and there are a lot of comments in the chat that I you know encourage everybody to read. We can't get to every comment that people have made, but they're very interesting comments and um, we look forward to seeing what you publish next that you're working on now and um, unless anyone has a specific question I think we can let um, Professor Carl get back to his uh, research. <laughs> well again thank you so much um, for inviting me Kim I mean this was a real it was a real pleasure to have a chance to um, speak with um, you know folks in Connecticut, you know, who've lived this history, who, who know it well. Um, and I, you know, I hope that if in some ways, you know, my book aims to kind of, um, you know, tell this story and, 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 and its relevance to today. I think, you know, that's, um, um, I hope that that will help continue this conversation and bring awareness to some of these issues that really, again, remain very much with us today. Yes, I certainly think it did for me personally anyway. And I also encourage everyone, even if you haven't read it, to read it, to read it and to visit our website and look at our videos that we have. Um, and I think this is all just a learning process um, and it's a wonderful time to be having all these conversations. It's really great. So thank you so much and we wish you good luck and thank you everyone for joining us. And we'll let you know when we pick our next book. Awesome. Will you share this recording? This was excellent. It will be on our website. Yeah, uh, probably. In the Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. And um, have a good afternoon and you know, watch out for the snow. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.